This afternoon, I am here with Dr. William Sandy Darity, and we are continuing this series of conversations about the history of the Sanford School of Public Policy in celebration of its 50th anniversary. And so, Dr. Darity, I thought that we could start uh, by getting a sense about how you came to uh, see yourself as someone who worked on public policy. Your PhD was in economics. Um, I noticed that your dissertation looked at uh, growth and development, but it also had an emphasis on redistribution as part of the, the series of essays that you wrote with some, you know, just some small fry economists at M MIT, uh, uh, including Robert Solo and Paul Samuels and some of the uh, big names in the field. Yeah, um, but my primary advisor was Lance Taylor. Lance Taylor, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Lance was uh, a wonderful advisor. Uh, you could drop your draft of a portion of a chapter or a portion of an essay in his uh, mail slot in the morning, and he would have it back to you in the afternoon with comments. <laughs> Although he was not a Nobel laureate, he was a pretty distinguished economist mm -hmm. in his own right, and he was terrific to work with. I could drop off a draft of an essay or a chapter in his mail slot in the morning, and he would have it back to me with comments in the afternoon. Hmm. So it made it possible for me to actually complete the dissertation much more rapidly than I might have been able to do so at another institution. Or another you did location. it very quickly, four years it looked like. No, actually it was three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I completed the dissertation in one year, but wow. I completed the PhD in three years. Yeah, yeah. wow. Um, but so you're, you're working on these big topics, it sounds like, in growth and development and, and redistribution. Did you think of yourself as working in public policy? Did you know of public policy as a field when you were doing this? Or? Uh, so I had some sense of public policy as a field because being at MIT, you were in close proximity to Harvard, mm -hmm. and the Kennedy School at Harvard was a center where there was a focus on public policy. And you know we were fully aware of that. And we also were fully aware that there was a significant number of economists in, in, in the policy school uh, at, at Harvard. So we had some understanding or some, some sense of what constitutes uh, a public policy school and what it does and what type of work takes place. Uh, but initially, I was, uh, I was only involved in taking academic positions in economics departments, mm -hmm. first at the University of Texas and then at, uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I remember, you know, frequently I would give presentations about my analysis of the world as it is, particularly the world as it is with respect to racial inequality. Mm -hmm. And I would always get a response from folks in the audience, well, you've painted this very pessimistic picture, what should we do about it? <laughs> and I would, in those days, I would say, well, you know, I think the hard work that I've done is explaining what the situation is. Now you're challenging me to take an even more difficult step after I've done this very hard work. Uh, but I think uh, as time went by, and as I had an opportunity to actually make a transition into a policy school, then I've moved in the direction of trying to provide people with answers to that question about what should we do. And I think maybe uh, most recently some of the, the ideas that I've had about what should we do have actually, uh, have actually taken hold in the public square and have reached, uh, reached conversations among people who actually have the capacity to make policy, policy changes. So I brought with me today uh, one of these write-ups <laughs> of one of your big ideas, um, Baby Bonds, um, which uh, we have floating around here at uh, the Sanford School um, yeah. for, for people to learn about. And, and it's something that uh, politicians like Cory Booker, it seems like they've at least heard about and have been interested in. I noticed that uh, with the topic of reparations, for instance, you have been someone who has been keeping this alive as a policy idea before the sort of recent uh, re-engagement with that question. Let's go back to you coming to Duke. You've been working at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, what, what brought you to Duke as a, as a research professor in 1999? So uh, I was approached by, uh, by the Sanford School about coming here and uh, went through the usual ritual of giving uh, a job talk and the like. And uh, when they continued to express interest in having me come here, 
at that point I said, well, I really don't want to leave UNC. And since the physical proximity of the two campuses was, was reasonable, even though the, uh, the athletic rivalry is quite <laughs> intense, uh, the folks at Duke said, well, maybe we can have the respective provost at the two institutions talk. Hmm. And I guess technically it wasn't the provost here, it was the dean of the faculty who was Bill Chafe. Okay. But he communicated with the provost at UNC, and they came up with an arrangement where I could take an unpaid leave from each school on alternating semesters. <laughs> so I wasn't double dipping, mm -hmm. uh, but it, essentially my salary would come from one school or the other hmm. in an alternating fashion. And so, so that's how it started. And, uh, and that arrangement lasted from 1999 to 2007. Hmm. Hmm. And you were doing the fall here at Duke and then the UN, and in the spring, spring you UNC. went back to UNC, where yeah. you were the uh, director of the Institute of African American Research, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that's correct. Yeah. Um, towards, towards, in that period of time. Yeah. And that sounds like an institute that would, uh, at least on occasion, engage some of these public policy questions, uh, correct? Or? Yeah, and I, I think uh, at that stage in, in, in my work and my thinking and my collaborations, I was increasingly moving in the direction of coming up with policy answers. Um, so you, you mentioned baby bonds, which is uh, uh, an idea that I worked on in conjunction with Derek Hamilton from maybe approximately 2009, 2008. So that was around the time that uh, I actually came to do. And, and to, be, to be candid, uh, baby bonds are not a bond. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a metaphor for a child trust account that would be given to each newborn infant upon birth. And the amounts of that trust account would be contingent upon the wealth position of their parents. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the lower the amount of wealth that uh, a family has that a child is born into, the higher the amount of the endowment that they would receive, which would be available to them upon young adulthood. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think even earlier than that, I did work on the development of uh, the idea of a federal job guarantee, mm -hmm. which also has had some resonance over the course of the past, past two years or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the idea that uh, the federal government would provide an assurance of a public sector job for every American adult. Uh, that this would be an option that would be available to them and it would involve receiving, uh, receiving a, a salary that would be above the poverty level but also uh, would, would include a benefits package that would be comparable to the benefits package that's available to all federal civil servants. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that folks would always have an option that's an alternative to a bad private sector job mm -hmm. and ultimately drive bad private sector jobs out of existence because uh, presumably no one would take them if they had the public option. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so that was a set of ideas that I began to really crystallize and develop when we entered into the Great Recession. But still earlier than that, I had been working on the question of what's the justification or rationale for a reparations program for native black Americans? And also thinking about how you might actually set up such a program. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are some cursory ideas in some of the papers that I did earlier in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the decade of the first decade of the 21st century, mm -hmm. including one that was published with Dania Frank called The Economics of Reparations that, that we, uh, we completed in 2003. So, uh, so kind of been at yeah. these kinds of issues for uh, slightly more than a decade at least. Do you remember any, any real turning point for you when, it, uh, when you said, okay, now is the time I'm gonna turn my attention towards the policy solutions um, rather than describing the problem? No. To be honest, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have kind of that, that crystal clear moment mm -hmm. where there was this transition from not really focusing on what you do about it to thinking about what kinds of solutions are out there. I think it was, it was a gradual process. I wasn't even 
aware that others might be noticing that I was increasingly doing policy relevant research. Mm -hmm. And so I actually was a little bit surprised when the Sanford School approached me. Uh, but when I visited, what I discovered was uh, that I really like the seminars here mm -hmm. because they're so salient for real issues that confront uh, confront not just not just American society but frequently global issues. Mm -hmm. And my experience being in the economics department and in economics departments in general was that a large proportion of the seminars uh, kind of have a dimension of. Uh, uh, you know, angels dancing on the head of a pen. <laughs> uh, they may be about certain kinds of questions that are interesting from the standpoint of parlor game curiosity, mm -hmm. but may not have much to do with the really, really important issues that confront us day to day. So what was this place like when you entered here in 1999? Um, you know, who, uh, what was particularly helpful to you to kind of integrate you into this place? What was, what was your experience? I don't recall having uh, any sense of anxiety or difficulty integrating into the Sanford community. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, I had a very interesting experience with the very first class that I taught mm -hmm. here. I kept going home and telling my wife, this is the greatest class of students, undergraduates I've ever had in my life. You know, this is just amazing. Uh, well, it, of course it was, because it turned out that I had a Fulbright Scholar, I had a Rhodes Scholar, I had a Marshall Scholar. <laughs> I had, uh, you know, had all of these really outstanding students who somehow had gravitated into this class, hmm. which was on the subject of racial and ethnic economic inequality. Uh, so, so I soon discovered, however, that this was an exceptional class. And there was more of a gravitation toward the mean in subsequent <laughs> classes. But, but that, was, that was a moment in which I said, wow, it's really fairly exciting to be here at Duke. And, and I, have had, I have had equally wonderful classes subsequently. I think this past semester I had a great class that I taught, uh, the uh, public policy class for, uh, for microeconomics. Okay. That was a, the students were terrific. Uh, but... but that's not always the case. And so, uh, yeah, I, l I learned more about what the normal pattern <laughs> is with, uh, with classes here after that first semester. But that was a very nice entry point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you find that any collaborations or people that you met here kind of helped you move towards developing this uh, case for about the economics of reparations and, and thinking about that? Or? Um, not so much. Uh, I think most of my collaborations for research purposes have been with faculty members who are not based here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't view that as a negative. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the nice things about a world in which we have, uh, have had the microelectronics revolution mm -hmm. is that it's fairly easy to keep in touch with people on any part of, in any part of the world. And so collaborations don't have to be linked to uh, to continued face-to-face -face contact, although face-to-face -face contact is valuable, but you don't have to do it all the time. Most of my collaborations have, have not been with faculty members here. You came here at a time when, um, based on my understanding, um, the Sanford Institute, as it was then, was starting to rethink um, uh, what kind of role it wanted to play with public policy and moving a little bit more towards policy engagement. Um, uh, rather than uh, focusing then, then on policy, policy analysis. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Is that something that you could sense while you were here? Is that something that um, uh, did you find that, that people were receptive to the fact that you were starting to engage in public policy um, in terms of moving these ideas from academia into the public sphere? So, so I can imagine, in terms of my own experience, in fact, observing that in many instances, traditional disciplinary departments are actually resistant to their faculty members having a, a public stage. I never had that sense here. I also uh, began to become aware of the fact that Duke actually generally is, is very enthusiastic about the uh, research contributions of scholars at this institution actually getting national visibility. Mm -hmm. So that combined with being in a policy school 
that had moved in the direction of saying it is important that the work that we do actually have an impact on the world mm -hmm. uh, made it fairly comfortable to have made more of a transition to, uh, to, to bringing my work into the public square. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that would not have happened in quite the same way if I was not at the Sanford School at Duke. I think that that's really facilitated uh, the prospect of more and more attention being drawn to some of the work that I've done. Um, so uh, why did you bring this arrangement, this fall-spring uh, dichotomy between Duke and UNC, why did you bring that to a close and, uh, and take up here full-time? So in 2007, uh, my Duke contract was about to expire because my tenure was exclusively at UNC. Mm -hmm. So I was on term contracts at Duke. As a research professor, that's what that means. And it was, it was about to expire, and I got some overtures that there would be an interest in having me come here on a full-time basis. And so uh, Duke made an offer on, uh, for me to come on a full-time basis, and, uh, and that offer uh, was sufficiently attractive <laughs> for me to say, yeah, it's time to make a move full-time here. One of the initiatives that you ended up doing was, was starting the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity. Yeah. Um, which, uh, so tell me a little bit about the process of that. How did you um, start that center? What was your idea for that center? Uh, how did it all come together? Originally, uh, I had a, a smaller center that was called the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's long been a desire of mine to have a research center that's intensively devoted to various dimensions of inequality. Um, and so um, at a particular stage, it looked like it was going to be possible for the university to provide seed resources for an expanded uh, version of the research network on racial and ethnic inequality. So we proceeded to try to develop that. In some respects, it, it was an opportunity to fulfill a passion of mine to have a, uh, a more fully developed research center that could address multiple dimensions of inequality. And, uh, and to go, to include not only thinking about racial or intergroup inequality, but to address problems of inequality in general mm -hmm. and in five different domains. And so those domains were wealth, employment, health, political participation, and education. Uh, and they're not necessarily discrete domains, sure. but those are the five areas of emphasis in the Cook Center. And so uh, actually it was very exciting to have the chance to really do something that I'd been thinking about doing hmm. for many, many years. Hmm. Do you think that that was an outgrowth of some of these uh, ideas that you've been developing about how to address these problems? Is, 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 in other words, is the research focusing, again, on describing problems as well as coming up with solutions for these problems? Or, yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, yeah. in our mission, we set as a priority not only trying to analyze the, uh, the sources or causes of various types of inequality, but to the extent that those inequalities lead to deprivations or disadvantages or lost opportunities for, 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 for anyone, mm -hmm. uh, what types of means of redress mm -hmm. should be put into play? And, and we explicitly say that we have a, a policy design mission. There are a few major changes that took place in this building, kind of around this area while you've been here. And <laughs> you been mean around. Like, like the transition from being an institute to a school? Exactly. Yeah. So that's where I was going to start. Did you, did you notice any big changes that came uh, along? Yeah, well, of course, the, because yeah. I was in an odd position. Yeah. Because I not only have an appointment in the Sanford School, but I also have an appointment in Arts and Sciences in African and African American Studies. Mm -hmm. I also have a secondary appointment in Economics, but... Uh, but the appointment that really links me to arts and sciences is the uh, appointment in African and African American studies. So while Sanford was still an institute, the institute was under arts and sciences. And so my appointments were in a single school. But as soon as the Sanford Institute turned into the Sanford School, then I have 
appointments that are split across mm -hmm. two different schools. And sometimes that leads to some difficulties in terms of uh, making everything consistent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't generally recommend it as a, <laughs> as a, as a desirable arrangement. <laughs> It sounds like a lot of faculty meetings. Well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I was looking at the faculty guide from when you started, and, and as I come through, um, one of the things that seems different now, although maybe not to the degree that we would like, is that it, this was not a diverse place um, when you first started here, it didn't seem like. Yeah. Um, and, 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 I mean, if, if you mean... Uh, by not a diverse place, a relative absence of black faculty. That's correct, yeah. That is still the case. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And while uh, the school was making gains when it came to uh, faculty members who were women, uh, it was still had yeah. a ways to go uh, then, and I think it's getting there uh, in maybe in some ways faster in, in that category than, than in others now. But um, Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a fair statement. Did, did you find that, that this place was conscious of that and trying to address that? or uh, I think some faculty members are conscious of it and concerned about it, and others were not so much. Um, I've always found that across all institutions that it has been more difficult to make the faculty more inclusive than it has been to make the student body more inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, that raises a host of questions about what is the dynamic of uh, the way in which faculties make hires, mm -hmm. who they decide, fits with them well, all those sorts of issues, and, and why there's more resistance in terms of changing the demography of a faculty than there is changing the demography of a student body. One of the concerns I have in the current moment uh, is that all of the other black faculty are at the junior rank. So I'm, I'm the only, uh, only black faculty member who is a tenured senior faculty member. There was a brief moment when, uh, when uh, Linda Burton, the sociologist, was actually on our faculty, but that, that, that was not very long lasting. Prior to that, Sherman James was on our faculty, mm -hmm. uh, but there's never been more than two of us who were uh, tenured senior faculty members. And I know that this is an issue that is not uncommon to public policy departments and schools across the country in some respects, but right. do you, how, do, how do you think about that and, uh, the, um, and the reasons why that has been was the case for so long in the history of, of public policy and why that continues to be a struggle for public so, policy? So, you know, there's, there's a part of me that says uh, there is some legitimacy to the claim that maybe the pipeline of available candidates is somewhat narrow, but there's also a part of me that says um, that there really is a resistance or an ignoring. Mm -hmm. Of, of the problem and uh, and you know one one could ultimately say that like other kinds of disciplinary departments other fields discrimination is operative in the process of hiring in uh, in, in the field of public policy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you think there are speaking of mechanisms do you think that there are clear mechanisms for addressing it that in place yeah like, so like so one of the mechanisms for addressing it which is is rarely used is uh, is is for uh, university administrations to use the stick instead of the carrot mm -hmm. and uh, and by that I mean one of the things they could do is refuse to allow any academic unit to hire additional faculty until they addressed their uh, their demographic imbalance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. We'll we'll see if uh, how willing administrators are. To well, they they them. haven't been yeah. thus far <laughs> at any institution that I've been involved. <laughs> But I, I can tell from some of your work that you like to play the long game. Part of it is seeding these ideas and letting them uh, incubate. Yeah. In it. That's interesting you say that because there's a real long game idea that uh, that has arisen in the context of controversies about affirmative action. Uh, you know, so so I actually think that affirmative action in admissions 
is something that has been under severe assault in recent years and, and may not survive. So I've been trying to think about other ways one might do this. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what I've, I've proposed when I was an undergraduate at Brown, there was a group of us who proposed this. We suggested that the admissions office divide their applicant pool into a group that was admitted based upon the judgments that the admissions officers made and another group that was admitted at random. <laughs> and then we said, you could compare the academic outcomes of these two groups mm -hmm. and make a judgment as to whether or not it really was critical for the admissions officers <laughs> to be making this selection judgment. That never happened. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and even you, at Brown, you, I can you, imagine you, that well, was a tough there, it wasn't going to happen at Brown. It wasn't going to happen almost anywhere. But in that context, in thinking about you know, especially this recent incident where it becomes clear that a group of very wealthy parents are actually fabricating their kids' portfolios, mm -hmm. uh, it suggested to me that what universities could do, selective universities, is that they could set a a floor for performance. And, uh, and that, that floor could be relatively high in terms of some sort of minimum grade point average, some sort of minimum combination of, of standardized test scores and the like. I mean, it shouldn't be outrageously high, but it could be high. And then take all of the students who meet that threshold and admit them at random. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then, so, so if you were concerned about inclusion, then your, your major task is making sure that you had adequate inclusiveness in your pool of applicants. Sure, sure. But you wouldn't have to worry about achieving that inclusiveness through the selection process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fascinating. It reminds me of, of research that uh, I think was presented here recently uh, that Susan uh, Dubarsky. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was, was Susan Donarski stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 No, no, it's just, um, have you found that this has been a really comfortable place in order to do the sort of policy engagement that, that you've gravitated towards over the, the last 20 years of your career? Yeah, there may be many things that come up that are uncomfortable, but in terms of pursuing the kind of policy analysis I've wanted to engage in, which is really focused on big policies, mm -hmm. not, not, uh, not, not smaller or more incremental policies, uh, I've found that I've been able to do that work here, and, and uh, it's been a good environment for doing that. Have you noticed uh, any significant changes between Sanford's relationship with Big Duke uh, over the years that, that you have been here? And well, I mean, an obvious one is the transition from being an institute to a school. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that that's been very significant, because once you become a school, to some degree you float on your own boat. Um, and uh, that means that there's a different set of issues that uh, have to be addressed with respect to uh, financing, financing the school. Uh, different kind of set of relationships have to be fostered with potential donors and benefactors. Uh, and it has to be done some, with, with some modicum of independence from other units on campus. And so, yeah, that's been different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Coming back to your engagement in public policy, um, uh, I, I noticed that your father, uh, also William Darity, um, yeah. worked on the North Carolina Fund, which was a major um, endeavor here as, as part of the war on poverty in North Carolina. Right. Um, and I was I was wondering if if and it actually it actually was it was was started under. Uh, under Terry Sanford's governorship, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who subsequently became uh, president of Duke University, mm -hmm. and in some sense, people say actually started the Sanford School, That's right, yeah, which probably. is named after him. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did that experience at all, either you know, conversations with your father, or kind of observing what his experience was like in terms of engaging very directly, in, in terms of trying to to shape um, shape policy in North Carolina, to shape programming here in North Carolina? Um, has that been a legacy at all that you have drawn on in, in terms of, kind of so, how you so, thought about your career and your work? And, yeah, and, I, I'm not so sure I drew so much on the legacy associated with my father's work with the North Carolina Fund, except for the fact 
that that was work that was focused on the problem of poverty. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, since I was very young, I was attuned in some way to saying that poverty and inequality are things that we really need to address, uh, not just in the United States, but on a global scale. But, uh, you know, it's a big enough task to try to do it in the United States, which is where most of my policy proposals have been, have been focused. But uh, I think what I gained from both of my parents was a real attentiveness to, uh, to the kinds of disparities that exist in terms of opportunities that people have, which are anchored in the luck of the draw in terms of which families you're born into. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that we need to try to make people's opportunities uh, more more uniform mm -hmm. in a, in a positive direction, sure. uh, yeah. and and that's that's really been a, a principle that I think has animated a lot of the work that I've done. Hmm. Is it meaningful at all to work in a building and, and at a school named for Terry Sanford? Is that, yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about the history of Southern governorships, mm -hmm. Terry Sanford is a pretty good guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so yes, <laughs> it's not not the best pool necessarily. You're being no, but he, against, he, but, uh, he yeah. is a pretty good guy. <laughs> Is there anything else that, that you want to say about uh, how your um, your connection here to the Sanford School is, has helped shape your work or, or molded your uh, outlook on, on some of these questions? Well, there are some faculty members at the Sanford School who have had some, uh, some, some relatively strong connections to the Cook Center. And I think that generally, and, I, and you know, a couple of folks who come to mind immediately are Anna Rude Krishna and Bob Korsnett, mm -hmm. uh, and I probably have overlooked somebody, but I hope not. <laughs> but uh, but there, there are other folks who have had intermittent connections with the Cook Center. Uh, but I think that one of the things that's really important about the Sanford School in this moment is that a significant number of faculty members are really, really dedicated to analyzing inequality in multiple dimensions. Mm -hmm. And so insofar as that's the spirit of the research that's being done here, it really means that uh, I, I have a foot in two different worlds that are very similar and very parallel hmm. in terms of the focus and interest of the scholars that I'm around. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Great. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.